How does a boy born into poverty become the greatest businessman in American history? Alfred P. Sloan Jr. transformed himself from a humble upbringing into the visionary leader who built General Motors into an industrial empire that became the envy of the corporate world. Against all odds, Sloan propelled GM from near collapse to surpassing Ford as the number one automaker in America. By the time he stepped down after 33 years leading the company, GM was the largest industrial enterprise on Earth with over $12 billion in sales. Sloan's meteoric journey from poverty to iconic business titan made him a legend in his own time. His enlightened management philosophies became the gold standard for global corporations. This video explores how a determined man revolutionized a company and capitalism. Alfred P. Sloan Jr.'s journey began in 1875 in New Haven, Connecticut, where he was born into a working-class family. His father worked as a coffee and tea merchant, while his mother cared for Alfred and his four siblings. When Alfred was just 10 years old, his family uprooted their lives and moved to Brooklyn, New York to be closer to his father's business. The big city environment of Brooklyn shaped young Alfred's formative years. He became accustomed to a life of hard work and perseverance amidst the hustle and bustle. From a young age, Sloan displayed an aptitude for mathematics, science, and technology. After graduating high school, he set his sights on attending the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology (MIT). At just 17 years old, Sloan was denied admission to MIT for being too young. But through determination, he secured a spot the following year. At MIT, Sloan pursued a rigorous program in electrical engineering. He immersed himself in complex technical coursework involving dynamos, motors, and power transmission. Outside of classes, he participated in an electrical engineering society to complement his classroom studies. Sloan's diligence paid off when he graduated from MIT in just three years at the top of his class. Armed with critical technical skills, the bright 21-year-old was ready to launch his career in 1895, the nation was still recovering from the intense depression of 1893. Jobs were hard to find. Sloan's father arranged an interview for his son with the father's friend, John Searles, head of the big American Sugar Refining Company in Brooklyn. Searles found a job for Sloan in a small company Searles had invested in, the Hyatt Roller Bearing Company in New Jersey. Alfred would start work as a mere draftsman. Sloan landed his first job at Hyatt Roller Bearing Company in New Jersey. The small company manufactured roller bearings for bicycles, gearboxes, and motors. They made bearings that made machines function more smoothly, with less friction. Starting as a humble draftsman, this position marked the first step on Sloan's journey to eventual business stardom. Little did he know, his modest upbringing and engineering education had equipped him for greatness. Sloan's natural business instincts kicked in shortly after starting at Hyatt in 1898. He built a close relationship with the company's sole salesperson, Peter Steenstrup, collaborating on ways to improve the struggling company. Sloan was a serious, ambitious young man. He wanted to marry Irene Jackson, but his career outlook was too bleak for him to consider marriage. This lack of progress led him to leave Hyatt after two years in 1897. Alfred joined a company developing a refrigeration system for hotels and apartment buildings. Refrigeration was another technology just coming into its own. Working for inventor Michael Wood excited the 22-year-old Sloan. The company's idea was to have a central cooling system that circulates cold to individual ice boxes in each room or apartment. Sloan designed the circulation system. He also built up the courage to marry Irene in September 1898. But soon after, the refrigeration company failed. Luckily for Sloan, Hyatt investor Searles had financial troubles and wanted to sell the money-losing Hyatt Roller Bearing Company. Equally fortunately, Sloan's father and a friend had the $5,000 required to buy the struggling business and limited additional funds to invest until the company became profitable. They wanted Alfred to return to Hyatt and take over, which he did at the age of 23. Sloan and Pete Steenstrup took over the business, Alfred did the engineering, and Pete handled sales. Both realized that Hyatt's future depended on catering to the booming automobile industry. They meticulously studied which automakers would benefit most from Hyatt's specialized roller bearings. Pete was soon visiting every major automaker. 
Pete tried to get Alfred to spend more time making sales calls with him because Pete could not speak the language of their engineer customers. At first, Sloan resisted, but eventually started visiting Detroit and meeting industry leaders. The duo then personally visited pioneers like Henry Ford and Billy Durant, the colorful founder of General Motors, to make technical presentations on how Hyatt bearings could improve vehicle performance and durability. Their engineering expertise, paired with sales savvy, helped them win major supply contracts. In the ensuing years, Alfred Sloan and Pete Steenstrup built Hyatt into a much larger, profitable company. While Pete retired, Alfred and his father became majority owners of the company and continued building it. Within an astounding eight years, Sloan rose from draftsman to general manager of Hyatt Roller Bearing. Just 28 years old, he was now responsible for leading the company. Sloan brought an engineer's discipline to ramping up manufacturing quality and efficiency. He improved production methods and installed new machines to boost output. Under Sloan's leadership, Hyatt grew from a dilapidated plant to an industry leader, generating over $9 million in annual sales. His reputation as an automotive supply expert spread across the industry. Over half of the company's revenue came from the Ford Motor Company, especially after the 1908 introduction of the Model T. Most of the remaining sales came from General Motors and its Buick, Oldsmobile, Oakland, and Cadillac divisions, which GM's Billy Durant had acquired in a haphazard fashion. Being at the mercy of two giant customers made Sloan nervous. He knew either company could make their own bearings or switch to another supplier. Hyatt's patents were set to run out, making the company's position even more tenuous. Maybe Hyatt should sell out to a larger company if the opportunity arose. Billy Durant was a born salesman and wheeler dealer. He had bought a troubled Buick and turned it into the largest auto brand before Henry Ford's Model T took over the lead. Buying every automaker that caught his attention, usually for stock, his General Motors had emerged as the second largest automaker out of hundreds in the market. At the time, the automobile companies were primarily assemblers, buying most components, including axles, bodies, and engines from other companies. Based on his experience making horse-drawn carts before entering the auto business, Durant liked controlling key suppliers, assuring his company's needs could be fulfilled. This led Durant to create the United Motors Company in 1916 by buying up some of the best auto parts makers and combining them into one firm. Billy Durant wanted Hyatt Roller Bearing to be included in United Motors. Alfred Sloan convinced his skeptical board to ask for $15 million, a price they thought unrealistic. Durant, well known for his generosity when buying companies, negotiated minimally, and the final price was $13.5 million. Alfred and his father evenly split $9 million of this, which is about $100 million each in today's dollars, making both men wealthy beyond their dreams. However, the purchase was made with a combination of United Motors stock and cash. Sloan Sr. and the other partners wanted mostly cash, so Alfred had to settle on taking more United Motors stock than the others. He was stuck with most of his personal wealth tied up in stock in a new company in an industry that many thought was highly risky. With over 3,000 employees and sales of about $9 million, Hyatt was a gem in the United Motors portfolio. Alfred Sloan thus felt it important to make sure United Motors succeeded. After transforming Hyatt into an industry leader, Sloan was now tasked with building up United Motors. His reputation and experience in transforming struggling companies were exactly what Durant needed. It seems like Sloan had a special knack for turning companies around. I wonder which businesses today could use his Midas touch. Share your suggestions in the comments below. Luckily for United Motors, Sloan was already formulating plans on how to optimize the company's potential. Fortunately, Durant made 41-year-old Sloan the president of United Motors and left him alone to manage and build the company. Sloan soon added Harrison Radiator and Klaxon Horns to the group. He also created United Motors Service, an organization that set up dealers across the nation to sell replacement parts made by the company. Above all else, Alfred started to test ideas and develop management policies to maximize United Motors' success. Two years later, in 1918, General Motors bought United Motors with GM stock. Alfred P. Sloan was now on the GM board of directors and head of all accessory parts divisions. He was 43 years old and had 20 years of experience running businesses behind him. He was also a large shareholder in General Motors. 
By 1918, Billy Durant had already been in and out of General Motors, losing control to Eastern bankers, then creating the very successful Chevrolet, selling Chevy to GM, and regaining control. He was brilliant at putting deals together, even agreeing to buy out Henry Ford before Durant's bankers refused to finance the purchase. But Durant was not a good manager. Rather than studying the data and making logical conclusions, he relied on his intuition and flew by the seat of his pants. He assigned tasks to whoever was at hand, ignoring their backgrounds and fit. He made operating decisions without asking the opinions of the key operating people involved. After the end of World War I, inflation took off. But then prices fell back down, and the nation went into a deep recession in late 1920 and throughout 1921. Sears Roebuck almost went bankrupt but was saved by personal investments by owner Julius Rosenwald. General Motors posted a loss of almost $25 million, the first loss in company history. The company ended 1921 with $200 million worth of unsold cars. The stock crashed, and the ever-optimistic Durant bought shares to try to prop up the market, going deeper and deeper into margin debt to buy the shares. Though Sloan's personal wealth was tied up in GM stock, he never sold one share, as the stock dropped from $85 per share to $7. The man had faith in the future. The DuPont family, owners of the giant chemical company, had first invested in General Motors a few years before. With large profits in their gunpowder business during the war, they continued buying into GM. To rescue their investment, DuPont paid off Billy Durant's debts. He left GM for the final time. Pierre S. DuPont reluctantly took over the presidency of GM. At the same time, Sloan wrote up his ideas on how best to organize General Motors. He sent his organization study to DuPont and did not at first get much reaction, but soon enough, DuPont studied the report and liked it. Pierre DuPont made Sloan his assistant. Sloan saw the need for a more structured management system to harness GM's potential. Though just 43 years old, he drew on his success at Hyatt to outline a plan to reorganize the company. Alfred Sloan achieved world fame as the man behind decentralization, the idea was that the managers of each operating division of the company, such as Chevrolet and Cadillac, had total operating freedom and control over their profit center. In his own words, place good leaders at the head of each division and it will prosper. Don't meddle in their business in the way that Billy Durant had. At the same time, Sloan needed to know how each division was doing in order to know if the company had the right people running the divisions. This decentralized system was accompanied by a system of very centralized financial controls to monitor every aspect of the business. Sloan was obsessed with data, with the facts, and trained his colleagues on the use of them. The vast operating parts of the company religiously submitted various reports every 10 and 30 days. However, Sloan always wanted to learn more and find more useful information. Sloan had tens of thousands of surveys sent to auto buyers, asking them what they wanted in a car, and what they liked and didn't like about GM's products. Not only did GM listen to what customers wanted, Sloan developed the idea of a car for every person purpose. With GM reorganized, Sloan focused on growth and innovation to topple Ford as king of the auto industry. He pioneered annual model changes to make last year's car look outdated. GM introduced concept cars to stoke demand and toured its latest models in nationwide Motorama shows. Sloan expanded GM's brands to cover every price point. He kept Chevy competitive with Ford's Model T while positioning Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac as aspirational upgrades. By acquiring niche brands, Sloan built a ladder of cars for every purse that made GM the go-to automaker for diverse American tastes. Sloan knew innovation required talent. He recruited brilliant innovators like Charles Kettering, who invented electric starters, diesel engines, fast-drying automotive paints, and more. Kettering's research laboratory made GM the industry's technology powerhouse. GM dazzled customers with novel features, allowing easier starting, shifting, steering, and braking. Beyond cars, Sloan expanded GM into refrigeration appliances, locomotives, aircraft engines, and transmissions. By acquiring Germany's Opel brand, he pushed GM's reach across Europe. Within a decade at the helm, Sloan grew GM's sales over tenfold, surpassing Ford in market share. His relentless innovation and brand expansion cemented GM as the number one automaker worldwide. 
In the many pages written about Sloan and his life, he is usually portrayed as being a man of steel, with ice water running through his veins. He cared nothing about people and had no life or interests outside of his work. He is depicted as formal, stiff, humorless, cold, and heartless. Man as machine. Profit was all he cared about. But if one sincerely tries to put themselves in Sloan's shoes, as head of a company upon which hundreds of thousands of families depend, would they act differently? Most consider Sloan the ultimate organization man. But Sloan spent 18 years building Hyatt Roller Bearing from nothing into an important company. The man was at heart an entrepreneur, with entrepreneurial instincts. Staying objective was critical for Sloan. He made tough calls like firing friends if performance suffered, and he readily promoted those he personally disliked if their merits justified it. This merit-based culture allowed GM's unusual mix of personalities to excel together, rather than fracture into rival fiefdoms. By empowering expertise and nurturing collaboration, Sloan brought out the best across GM's engineering, marketing, and design visionaries. They knew promotions came from results, not politics. The innovative yet disciplined company Sloan molded served as a template adopted by corporations globally for decades to come. His name became synonymous with modern management best practices. Even in retirement, Sloan generously gave back the fortune he amassed to promote healthcare, education, and science. Alfred Sloan died in 1966 at age 90, just as GM peaked as the world's largest and most profitable industrial company. His life story is a testament to the boundless potential of the American dream. Despite humble beginnings, Sloan's relentless work ethic, thirst for knowledge, and enlightened leadership propelled him to the pinnacle of business renown. Over 33 years, he transformed GM from a flailing wreck into the envy of the global industry, cementing his legacy as one of the greatest business leaders in history. More than half a century later, Sloan's innovations continue to inspire and shape the corporate world. That's it for today's video. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Your support helps us reach more people with our content. Thanks for watching, and consider watching our other videos right here.